What's going on everybody? Welcome back to the Mindful Homestead, Jack here. First off, if you're not already a subscriber to the channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button down below. We'd really appreciate it. For everyone who already is a subscriber, thanks a bunch for following us over the past couple months or year or whatever it is we've been doing this. We're really happy that we're able to show you guys what we're doing here on the farm and give you an idea of how you can do it for yourself as well. So I'm headed into the garage here and we're gonna take a look at this year's meat birds. These little guys are about a week old right now. Uh, we got them last Wednesday and Thursday. It was split between two shipments. We had a few from the Thursday shipment die. Um, you know, they had to spend an extra an extra day in the post office system, which is not, you know, the, the best for these little guys. Uh, you usually try to make that make that trip as quick as possible. So we had a few die. Um, of the 60 that we ordered, McMurray shipped 62 and we're down to 58 right now, which is pretty good. You plan for about 10% loss. Uh, we actually order 60 because we hope for 50 finished birds. Let me put this little guy back right here. That's how we do it. Some people do it out differently where, you know, they'll order a whole lot more and, you know, expect a bunch more to die off. And some will actually order what they want. And, you know, if they lose any, it's kind of a problem. For us, we plan on 50 finished birds in a batch. That's what we budget for. We keep 25 for ourselves out of each batch and then we sell off the other 25. This year, we're doing things a little bit differently with our meat birds. In the past, we've raised all of our meat birds out on pasture, just like you see behind me. This is nothing special. This is just standard grass. It's our front lawn. You can see the house right there with all the flower gardens and stuff. This is how we raise our chickens. It gives them space to run around inside the chicken tractors. And we like raising them on grass. The problem is with the lower style chicken tractors that we've used in the past, and really any chicken tractor, if you're maximizing the space inside that chicken tractor, you're running out of grass extremely quickly because meat birds, especially Cornish crosses, they poop so much. They're literally like, I'm convinced food goes in their mouth and the food that they eat pushes the poop out the back end. So those Cornish crosses, even though they're on grass, because they poop so much, within an hour of moving a chicken tractor, a lot of the times that grass is gonna be matted down completely and they're not pecking or scratching in the grass. They're essentially just standing around on top of a layer of their own poop, which they've already compacted down. If I'm being totally honest about it, I don't even really consider it pasture raising if that's gonna be the way they're living mainly because if you move a chicken tractor and within an hour they're standing around on top of their poop, does it really matter if you had wood chips or grass underneath them at all to begin with? So in one of our recent videos, you saw me lay out the poultry one netting that you see behind me here as the space where we're gonna do our meat birds this year. Some of it's down right now. I had to move it because my parents were up visiting and they had their RV parked right here. So I didn't want them to run over the chicken fencing, obviously. But this is where we're gonna be raising these meat birds this year. And they're gonna be out on this grass. They're gonna have this whole area to themselves. And hopefully we are going to convince them to move around this pen by placing their food and water in different places inside the, the fencing every time we feed them or every couple days move it. And hopefully get them moving around and being a little bit more active than your standard Cornish cross. Because if you've raised Cornish crosses before, you know that they tend to just like sit next to the feeders and just gorge themselves on food and then poop and then everything turns gross really quickly. So today we're gonna go to Lowe's and we're gonna pick up the lumber that we need for our new chicken tractor, which is gonna be one of the John Suskovich style tractors. The reason we're building a Suskovich style tractor over the lower to the ground Salatin slash Lumna Acres slash other chicken tractors that we've used in the past. If you've ever tried to pull chickens out of one of those chicken tractors, it's a huge pain in the butt. It's low to the ground. You kind of have to like get in there and, you know, crawl under there. And by the time you grab the first one, they all run to the back of it. And they're not the most user-friendly chicken tractors. If a chicken gets stuck, you know, while you're moving it, you've got to kind of go around the back and pick it up. You can't really see what's going on back. They're just not the most efficient. So we're going to go with a Suskovich style tractor, which means that we're going to have to buy some more lumber because I don't have the stuff on hand to build that. If you saw our most recent video, which I'll link up here in the corner, I recently picked up a pallet of pig feed, which is 2000 pounds, exactly one ton. And I had to make multiple trips in my Nissan Frontier. And with a thousand pounds in the bed, it still wasn't very happy. I could tell going over bumps and railroad tracks that it was kind of not excited to have that much weight in the bed. And Jackie and I have been talking about for a while, getting something that would be a farm truck 
that we could actually use for farm related tasks when we needed to carry a bunch of weight. Well, we finally made that call. As much as I loved my Nissan, it was time to get rid of her. She had 150,000 miles on her. Uh, I daily drove her for my full-time job and I needed something that was gonna be a little bit bigger and a little bit more reliable. So enter this. So what we picked up was a 2016 F250 Super Duty. This is a four door model with the six and a half foot bed out back. Now I'm gonna head something off at the pass here. I know there's gonna be a bunch of Chevy guys. I know there's gonna be a bunch of Dodge guys that are gonna all start getting into the comments and slinging mud back and forth. That's cool. I'm not saying Chevy makes a bad truck. I'm not saying Dodge makes a bad truck, even though Dodge makes a bad truck. I'm just saying we're a Ford family. Jackie's got her Ford Explorer. My parents have had Fords growing up. I never had issues with Fords personally. The 5.4 engine liked to shoot spark plugs out the head. Might have been a little bit of an issue, but that's not a problem. This has the 6.2 in it. In this video, I want to go a little bit into detail about why we picked this particular truck and the decisions we made that led us to it over some of the other options, such as going diesel, going long bed, going F350, going F150. We had a lot of thought that we put into this and I want to kind of hash that out and lay it on the table for other people that may be thinking about making a similar decision. So let's hop up into this thing. We'll get going to the store and I'll talk a little bit about it on the way there. All right, so we're here at the Box Giant store. You can see it over there. Uh, we're gonna go inside. I'm not gonna bring the real camera, I'm gonna bring my phone. Well, let's go inside, let's get the lumber we need to build this chicken tractor, and then we'll hop back in the truck. quite an experience. There was not much lumber there. There's a selection of pressure treated lumber that you need for a Suskovich tractor and I was able to get it, but uh, but there wasn't much there in addition. Correction, they didn't have the one by fours. They were totally out of pressure treated one by four, uh, but the, all the two by fours that you need, they did have and I was able to get those. But man, it was, um, it was quite an experience getting the stuff I needed. So here we are with a new truck. Why did we get something like this when we're kind of into the homesteading lifestyle, which is more or less frugal and paying attention to what you have and really not kind of overextending yourself too far? Well, for one, my truck had a lot of miles on it and it was getting to the point where it wasn't really reliable as a daily driver for me. I regularly will pick Emma up from daycare when she goes or depending on Jackie's work schedule, there are days where I'm taking Emma somewhere and her car seat in the back of my smaller pickup, it fit okay when it was just me and her. But if we needed to go somewhere as a family, if we were going to the hardware store or the lumber yard or something like that, and we were gonna need to put something in the bed, but we wanted to go as a family, Jackie really couldn't ride because the passenger seat to fit Emma's car seat had to be way up against the dashboard. She could technically fit in it, but it wasn't very comfortable at all. So we wanted something with a little bit bigger cab. Lastly, if we're being honest, the payload in that Nissan was not necessarily the greatest for what it was. I liked the truck, it was super comfortable, but it would do about 1200 pounds total payload, meaning me as a driver plus whatever I put in the bed. When you're talking about raising pigs and getting feed, and going to the store and picking up your pig feed, plus your chicken feed, plus your duck feed, and then whatever else you've got, things start getting really heavy really quickly. Speaking to the pig feed that we picked up last week, if we'd had this truck at the time, it would have been as easy as driving to the feed store, having them load the pallet of it up in the bed, and then we could have driven home. And once it got home, it was simply moving it out of the bed into the garage. One time I would have just had to go through those bags. The way we did it with the Nissan, where I had to break it up into two trips, I had to go to the feed store, break up the pallet, put 20 bags in the back of the Nissan, bring them home, unload them, go back to the feed store, put 20 more bags in the back of the truck, come home and unload those as well. 
And it's not the end of the world, but it's just way more work than I really wanted to do when you could drop one pallet of feed in the back of this thing and just take off with it. The other part of it too with the Nissan is that it was not necessarily made to haul lots of heavy goods. Even though we were at payload capacity for that truck and it was still within spec, when we were going over railroad tracks and things like that on the way home, it was sitting hard on the bump stops. It wasn't really happy about it. And if I were to do that regularly, which is what we're doing here on the homestead, it would have eventually broken a leaf spring and it would have made me have to put more money into the truck. A three quarter ton truck or a one ton truck, it's designed to do work. So if you're gonna be using it as a truck and not just a glorified people mover with a bed on the back, you wanna move up into a work truck. You wanna move into something with an actual frame under it that's got a lot more capacity and a lot more beef to it if you're gonna be transporting that heavy stuff. I kind of want to start working on this chicken tractor today, but even though it's sunny right now, I got home about an hour and a half ago and it's been raining since then. I'll leave the lumber in the back of the truck. I'll unload it a little bit later, but I think I'm going to let it hang out for now and I'm going to run to the store and I'm going to grab some stuff that we need. It's canning season right now and I've been making a lot of our jellies and jams for the year. I did blueberry the other day. I did a blueberry strawberry the other day. And today I'm going to finish up with our strawberry jam. I'm also gonna make a zucchini relish recipe that I got from Brian over at the Homestead Journey podcast. He sent it to me the other day. He had posted about it and I said, wow, that looks really good, let me know. And go figure, we had a huge zucchini come out of the garden the other day. It was one we had missed. So I'm going to go to the store and get the stuff because we're out of sugar. And then there's one or two spices I need that I don't have. So I'm gonna run to the store and do that now. I'm not gonna bring you along with me because it's just going grocery shopping. You don't need to see that. All right, so we are in the kitchen, as you can see. It's not the night that you saw in the beginning of this video. It's actually the next night because what happened was life happens. And when I pulled out the zucchini relish recipe, I realized that the veggies needed a 12 hour soak in the salt to remove a bunch of water. So I've actually got that going. I did that earlier today. You can see all the, I don't know if you can see, maybe you can see right there got all the water draining I did these this morning so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna step up we're going to drain these and then we're gonna finish out the canning recipe I'm also gonna be editing while I do this because there's some downtime when you're making zucchini relish it's about a 45 minute cook so the footage that you just saw I actually edited while I was canning this it's kind of like some weird inception stuff like a video within an edit within a video I don't know let's get to canning this stuff so I'm not up till 3 in the morning So in this pot, we have 12 cups of diced zucchini, four cups of sweet onion, diced as well, two red bell peppers that are diced up, one green bell pepper that's diced up, and then a half a cup of salt. And then it's just been tossed all together and let drain for 12 hours. Two and a half cups of white granulated sugar, two and a half cups of white vinegar, And then for spices and other seasonings, we're using a tablespoon of ground nutmeg, a tablespoon of ground turmeric, which I went a little bit heavy on, four tablespoons of prepared horseradish, which is gonna give us some kick. And this is one diced red jalapeno. These are gonna go in as well. Just give this a quick stir to combine everything. And you're gonna let this come to a boil and simmer for about 45 minutes. You want everything to really kind of get together. While that simmers, I am going to head over to the computer and I'm going to start editing the footage that you just watched.
So that's it right there for our zucchini relish. We've got four pints of that jarred up. So far during this canning season, we've done four pints total of strawberry blueberry jam. And we've done four pints total of blueberry jam. I've still got some straight up strawberry jam to go. And then we've got some peaches. We might do a strawberry peach jam with uh, to eat up the strawberries. We've got a ton of strawberries in the freezer. So we might do a strawberry peach jam because I only have four peaches. We'll figure it out though. Thanks for watching the video and have a great day. Bye.